my oldest brother, um, he, he had a good friend named JP Variano, and from he was pro- uh, probably four years older than me, and yeah. he was in the Air Force and flew drones, and I had him on my podcast, like probably first twenty episodes, I hadn't talked to him in forever. He, I asked him if he had any friends or I knew anyone. And he put me in touch with um, with another one of his Air Force friends, Nick Phelps. I had Nick on. We had a good podcast. He put me in touch with Dan Libby. <laughs> Dan and I did a couple episodes, and I kept bugging him about aliens. And he was like, I don't know anything about aliens. And he was like, you know, he's like, I, I know a guy who uh, was an Air Force historian. I was like, yeah, man, ask him. And then finally, after three episodes, he's like, yeah, so that guy's my brother. And I was like, why did you withhold that the whole time? <laughs> I was like, why didn't you just tell me that the first time? And uh, yeah, so yeah, actually, yeah, now that I think of it, yeah, it's been a long chain of events that's led me here, but I'm finally here and I'm going for the answer. So um, awesome. awesome. Why don't you, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Because uh, I never give adequate introductions, so. No problem. My name is David Libby. I was um, the Holloman Air Force Base, Air Force historian, late 1995 into about late 1998. So about a three, about a three, three and a half year time period mm-hmm. in there. Um, it was definitely during the, the Clinton administration was the big part of that. Um, and uh being the historian, I actually cross-trained out of one job in the Air Force into that job, and I I didn't know what I was getting into. I mm-hmm. didn't realize just how small of a career field the history office was, it, and it's it's made up of civilians and military personnel, mm-hmm. and eventually, I think, over the years, I've been out for quite a few years now, but they um, probably went more to civilian operators yeah. than they did military necessarily. Yeah. So, what all does that what all does that consist of? Being a like a base historian is that just is that is it smaller stuff like keeping minutes, or is it just in general like the actual history of the base? I I'm completely in the dark. I don't know. Well, I I was too. After <laughs> I, I mean, I really was. I'm like, what am I getting myself into? I was originally stationed at Edwards Air Force Base, where if you're familiar with that, of all kinds of testing programs. And there's a connection to our topic that we're going to be talking about today through Edwards Air Force Base and some other places. People have this misunderstanding that historian is like a glorified secretary, and so you are just taking minutes or whatever. Yeah. But, it, it, but in a nutshell, it's every six months you're writing what I call a current history, even though it's six months in the past. Okay. So as long as the predecessors have written their histories – then you're only six months behind. So you're writing current uh, history every six months. So you're publishing two uh, documents, be it classified or unclassified documents, depending on where you work. Uh, and there may be elements of both in in those documents, but every six months you're producing something. Mm. And at the time in the nineties, as you may be aware of, and internet technology was horrible. It sucked. Yeah. It's still, you know, word processing sucked. It's, yeah. I mean, I was a lot. We had DOS printers still. Uh, I mean, it was horrible. And then you had to take an already antiquated system and classify it so that when I did my classified work, I could only use that one system that it's the old dial up spin up. Yeah. I mean, it was horrible. Yeah. But. That's what was secure at mm-hmm. a time. It almost seemed like analog compared to nowadays. Yeah. So you write a current history. It's published, and it's published in triplicate. Okay. And so it's maybe 100-plus pages per document with about 12 to 15 source documents that support all that evidence. Okay. Now, I'm under the impression that in years past, when before it was the Air Force, the Army Air Force, they may not have had the exact same guidelines of um, publication that I did when I was serving. So for example, um, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head if it was triplicate when it was produced, when it was originally written, like it was when I was in during the 1990s. So, uh, but they had copies, they had hard copies, they had 
digital copies and then Air Force Command gets a copy, your base gets a copy and then Air Force Command, well, you know, mm-hmm. nationwide, they get a commit. So it's on the repository. Mm-hmm. All the information you can think of is there. And so when I wasn't writing history, I was reading history. Yeah. And so I had this huge top secret vault in my office i mean i thought it was a bank vault with a you know the the, oh, yeah. the dial in combination and you had to change it every so often and it it was a big deal man it was a big deal to walk into that and i was a little lowly e4 yeah. you know so yeah truck the whole history program for that base so so you produced a a <clears throat> Every six months, it'd be you produced a classified and an unclassified. So there's the classified history, and then there's the, I guess, public knowledge history or publicly accessible history. Well, the one when I was in, because of the weapon system that I wrote about, it was all classified. Ah. Right, and so uh, I can only talk about so much of it. Yeah. But it was the F one seventeen A stealth fighter. Yeah, and so tracked its history from the deserts of Nevada. Yeah. And then when they became publicly operational, <laughs> put it that way, um, that's when they got stationed at Holman Air Force Base. And then that's where I kind of came in and kind of continued that history for the about the three years that I was there. Yeah. So it was kind of interesting. So when people asked about you, well, before it was publicly operational. Right. What was, uh, what's, the, what's the go-to response? Just, you didn't uh, say that? Well, the go-to response is that the stealth fighter was operating years before anyone thought it was operational. (laughs) I mean, we're talking back in the 1980s, mid, late 80s, it was operational, and people had no clue whatsoever what was flying over their airspace and hitting targets. Everyone going, what the heck was that? You know, I mean, all of a sudden, you didn't even hear anything, even though it made sound, but you didn't hear anything, you didn't see anything on radar. All you knew is that something just got blown up. Yeah, yeah. And you have no idea how. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the ground the ground team would come in and kind of mop up. So yeah. it was kind of interesting. Have you read uh, – I always bring up books on this podcast. Sure. I always say read. I listen on Audible, and I don't read. It makes me sound a lot <laughs> smarter. Everyone's always like, oh, you, dude, you're so well read. I'm like, dude, I play video games, and what I do is I, is I mute it because it's a video game I've played a million times. Right. So I mute it, and I listen to audiobooks. Mm-hmm. And so that's my mm-hmm. way of learning. So I'll be playing, just I'll be driving around, you know, just blowing up cars, but I'll be listening to like a history of the ancestry of FDR. So when I pull these facts out of nowhere, it's always like, you sound so well read. And I'm just like, man, it sounds so much better than it looks. But uh, <laughs> um, that being said, have you ever read or listened to uh, Skunk Works by Ben Rich? I've heard of Skunk Works. Uh, I, I haven't read that book that you're referring to. Um, but I had to become somewhat familiar with Skunk Works, mm. seeing how there's connection there with the F-117. Yeah. And so it, um, I'm not sure what the premise is or the argument or the claim is in that particular book. Maybe you can fill me in and I can oh. kind of touch base on that a little bit from what it's, I know. Oh, no, it, it's, it was more just a history of his time at Skunk Works. It was just yeah. – but, yeah, it starts with the F-117. Yeah. And uh, it starts with they're doing like a test – and they're having it fly over some radar and they're down there with the ground unit and the ground unit obviously it's it's neat to know so they all they know is they're testing a new stealth thing but it was so it was a special access program so it was so secret that they had figured out like a geometric like a geometric configuration that reduced its radar, uh, radar cross section to that of a, a ball bearing that they didn't even let the people in the military in on that Right. They're, they're like this right. is a this is a paradigm shift in military superiority. Right. I mean, he describes it as like we used to send multiple planes out on multiple sorties to hit one target. Now we send one plane out on one sortie to hit multiple targets. He's like it's a complete. He was like it was you know it was the biggest shift since really thermonuclear weapons and in terms of just getting a a pit, just a leap ahead of everyone else. So he goes right. it's coming, and they've got the they've got the chase plane. And uh, he goes, because we couldn't tell them how this was going to evade radar, we had to make something up. So he goes, yeah, there's a – Ben Rich goes, yeah, there's a little uh, – there's like a box in the in the nose cone. You can't see it, but it's a stealth box, and it jams radars. <laughs> and so the thing comes over, and it they see like the chase plane, 
and they, they they paint the chase plane and all the radar guys look at it and I'm like is that it and then they apparently everyone gets quiet and they're like what is that and they just see a black triangle go overhead and nothing pings and by right. that time if if they had been enemies they would have been blown to pieces and that's right apparently all the guys were like man you got like you got quite the box in there like that's crazy and like they were none the wiser it had nothing to do with that so it was right. crazy that there was even secrecy within the military but yeah, no, there's no claim in it. It's just it's just right. an awesome history. Yeah. Well, and, and they they had to be secretive. You know, anytime these, every time the military creates anything top secret, they divide out the contractors who build these things. Even mm. to that way, <laughs> even the, <laughs> that way, if they're captured, I guess by the enemy or yeah. something, tortured, they can't tell them everything because they don't know everything. Yeah. And it's done that way for a reason. Yeah. Uh, What's interesting though is the stealth fighter, and this has been since declassified, is it 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 only carries two bombs. Yeah. And so to hit multiple targets is not really realistic unless they're able, unless the military has designed a bomb that is the same size as the payload they can carry. Yeah. That's more like a cluster bomb, yeah. you know, with multiple type of, but it's not really. Usually they're just 2,000 pound laser guided bombs that they can be bunker busters or yeah. they just take out communications towers like we did in Desert Storm against Saddam Hussein. So mm. it's, it's two bombs, and that's it. No machine guns, yeah. nothing. Yeah. It cannot fight air to air. Yeah. It's air to ground and then get the heck out of there and let's get home before they realize we were there. And yeah. That's what I love. I was in uh, just at the end of Desert Storm, and when we sent the stealths over there, everything that you saw on the news, um, having seen, I, having seen the actual cockpit footage, I had that as well. Uh, literally, what you saw on the news was after RF-117s flew by, bombed, destroyed targets, never missed one. And we're already on their way home. And then all of a sudden, the night sky there in Baghdad lit up yeah. like the 4th of July. But they were shooting at nothing. There was nothing in the sky because we already hit our targets. We were gone. They never saw us. Never saw us. Never lost a plane. And we just did that repeatedly. And they're like, Saddam is saying, like, what the oh, heck? Yeah. Shut the front door. You know, yeah, what's yeah. going on here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah man. Maybe that's his technicality. If it was two bombs, maybe two targets is technically multiple targets. But... <laughs> Well, you know, when you have a, a squadron of F-117s flying yeah. and they're dropping at multiple targets in the same strike package, sure. no problem, right? You're hitting multiple targets that way. Yeah. So that's pretty maybe, interesting. Yeah, maybe that was the wording. Was it be like, let's say we had target A. And he's like, right. yeah, we would send out like, normally you'd send out like, you know, multiple sorties, either one plane or multiple planes. And you would do a couple of runs. Correct. And maybe even a couple of days apart, eventually you'd get it. And it'd be like, okay, we got it. But he was like, now we are sending out these sorties instead of just like, all right, you know, maybe today, what's today? What is today? Monday? Yeah. They're like, okay, Monday. let's say today's Monday. <laughs> like, let's, by Friday, if we if we fly a sortie every day, maybe we'll hit target A by Friday. Right. And it changed to, all right, today's Monday. Let's uh, send these guys up and we'll have uh, targets A, B, C, and D by sundown. You know, we'll be through Z by Friday. So that was the, the paradigm shift. Yeah, man. Um yeah, that's another thing is a uh, is um, compartmentalizing. Is, right. That's right. one thing they said. That's what Ben Rich said about uh, the U two pilots. Was like mm -hmm. it wasn't even that. You know, they were very well trained and you know to resist torture and not mentally break. But he's like the best insurance against not having them break is have them as in the dark as their captors are. Mm -hmm. Be like, be like, mm -hmm. I get captured and they're like Tommy, like where is the b2 stationed i'm like i don't know man like <laughs> you, like you know you can you can you can chop my hands off you can start breaking bones i don't know the answer so it's that's right that's right yeah so uh yeah on like classified stuff so i i actually called northrop grumman a couple weeks ago <laughs> wow <laughs> i just went out yeah man i was just like yeah hey, I, I wrote an email to a general mattis's secretary retired mm -hmm. general mattis asked if he do my podcast <laughs> and she she responded i actually got a response he said general mattis laughed but he said uh he's he's flattered but he's far too busy i'm like what <laughs> so but after i got a response i was like oh man i didn't even get like reject I, well i got rejected but i got a response so i was like second me some like, courage to start calling other people 
So I called, just, I went on their website and I found a number and I called Northrop Grumman. And yeah, I kind of surfed around until I thought I found the right person. And I was like, hey, my name's Tommy. This is my podcast, blah, 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 blah. I was like, can I have someone on to talk about the B-21 Raider? No. <laughs> I, I was, okay. Not at all. Why would you even talk about that on this line? And I was like, oh my God. I was like, I'm, I was like, because there is stuff on YouTube. Like it's, the existence isn't denied. Like we know it's being built. I was like, right. I'm sorry. I, so eventually we got to the point where she was like, what department do you work in? And I was like, I don't. Like, I'm 29. I have a biology degree. I don't... And she was like, oh, apparently I had somehow gotten a number, f like, f and like an intra-company number. Wow. And she thought, I was an, she thought I was an employee calling, asking if I could go on a podcast and talk about it. And she was like, oh, she was okay. like employees okay. are not supposed to talk about it, even on the lines. And I was like, oh, no, I'm just like an idiot. I'm just... I don't know you. I was just, she was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And she was like, yeah, that's a big no-no. And I was like, okay. So I gave her like my email and phone number and she's like, we'll get back to you. They never got back to me. But yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. You're like, you're like, you didn't have uh, black suited men come knocking on your door. <laughs> well, I, 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 I know. I, well, I, I talked to Dan. Dan goes, oh, they absolutely thought you were probing. Like, oh, yeah. She was oh, like, yeah. I'm sure they, you know, just like, just like, you know, whenever we have fighters come close to our border and we escort them and we do the same to Russia, we're just we're probing response That's times. Right. He, right. he goes, oh, yeah, they absolutely think you're probing, you know. And I was just like, oh, man. <laughs> like, like, oh, well. So, yeah, yeah. So, Tommy, you're going to get a knock on the yeah, door. Here that's I, was, I was kept looking for, like, the black helicopter. Like, I was, I was hoping the American flag wouldn't know, like, hey, man, I'm, I'm on our side. Like, but, uh, yeah. So not learning my lesson, the next day I called Lockheed Martin oh, and <laughs> tried, to <get> them, <laughs> tried to get them to talk about the SR-72 because they're more open with that. They announced in November 2013, they literally announced the successor to the SR-72 uh, is being constructed. Um, I was with my, my brother at the time who was doing research at uh, Georgia Tech for the Air Force. And I remember him, I go, hey, I go, hey, John, look, they, they announced the SR-72. Because, I, I mean, we have pictures of us, like, touching the SR-71 on the Intrepid at right. the aircraft carrier on Manhattan when we were, like, right. five. We'd always loved this thing. So I was like, look, right. they announced the success of the SR-72. And I go, they're, they said it's going to be it's going to be ready in 10 to 20 years. And he goes, they just announced that they're constructing it. It'll be ready in 10 to 20 years. And I go, yeah. He goes, he goes that's that's Pentagonese for this has been operational for 10 to 20 years. And he goes, <laughs> he goes they're not building the SR-72. They're, they're announcing the SR-73. And I was like, okay. So yeah. I, ca I called yeah. them and asked if I could get someone. I called their hypersonics department. And, uh, yeah, kind of got the same runaround. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Maybe I should stop calling defense contractors. <laughs> I, uh, yeah. Hey, look, uh, I, when I was at the history office, uh, some civilian book author of some sort um, somehow contacted the base, and they go through public affairs, and they go to the, goes to the wing commander, and all of a sudden, eventually, I get this phone call. And she she wants to conduct research to write some book. And because I've never heard of this person and I know what's in my vault, I'm going, what kind of clearance does this person have? Who are they? I mean, mm. hopefully JAG and everyone else has done their background research on this person. I have no idea. But this person must have spent about a week with me and I had to give them full access to the classified material as a civilian. And they're writing it down, which at the time, um, Clinton... President Clinton was in office, and I want to say that it was his administration that passed some type of declassification bill or something like that. So, so many documents finally had become declassified and open to public view. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that was just a precursor to trying to get a jump on everybody else to maybe write books. Yeah. And I couldn't even, couldn't even tell you who she was anymore yeah. or yeah. the title of what her book might have been, but it, it was – you get in that world and, and I would say I wasn't even in the black op world but you just get in that classified world and you're suspicious of everybody mm. who wants to come into your office and yeah. just chat with you and, yeah. and do other things so it's it was interesting and as far as his day to day historian type stuff it's pretty boring yeah. quite honestly it, yeah. it is you're just reading reports you're, you're kind of synthesizing all this information and, and then you, you write essentially a, a, a just a long report 
kind of a summary breakdown, if you will. Yes, there's specific details in there, and, and then it gets, you know, people edit it and everything. It gets published, and and unless something is happening, uh, again, it's just boring, boring work. And we had some interesting things happen um, at Holloman Air Force Base. The, um, and of course, it was it was all centered around the stealth fighter. We had our own support group as far as um, we call them pararescue in the military. And they're like our special forces to go get shot down pilots. And so mm-hmm. um, they, they run HH-60 Blackhawks and they go in behind enemy lines and they go get any pilots, yeah. whether Air Force or not. They, they, they're, they're the ones that go in there. And then you have forward operator controllers. And what they do is they, they are on the ground and they paint laser paint targets too. So a lot of times you don't hear the Air Force side of – Hmm. What we do, you always hear of SEAL teams and all this other things that they, they go in, which they do that too, of course. But Air Force had to have its own special operations yeah. units to be able to do those types of things. Yeah. So uh, it was interesting uh, talking to those guys and interviewing them and just some of the operations that they went on that you'll never hear of. Um, yeah. And then it, it, it just, it's it's interesting, it, it really interesting. But if if I could say I had free time, I knew since I was the point of contact for the history office that any type of history question would eventually get routed to my office. Mm. And so it didn't matter if it was a public affairs newspaper article and they just wanted some background history, people doing research, writing books, whatever, you know, documentaries, those types of things. But I, I started reading as much as I could about the history of the base mm. because people were going to look at me as some type of expert. Yeah. Yeah, And I had to know what I could tell them and what I couldn't tell them. And Holloman Air Force Base alone has a deep, rich history with the space program oh. and with uh, military units and with NASA and with – you could just kind of fill in the blank. It's, it's amazing. I mean it sits next to White Sands Proving Ground or Testing Ground. And so it's like the largest land-based – um, weapons testing mm. in, in the well, certainly in the United States, but almost in the world. But adjoining that, you know, it has that alternate landing field for the space shuttle and the space shuttle program was running, and it landed one time out there as well, just to prove that, that it, it can worked, be yeah. done at White Sands. So I mean, uh, it's yeah, it's there's a lot of history there, and of course, if you talk to my brother, even off off record, to just. You know, it's all weather balloon operations out there, right? It's all weather, which it they, was. It used to be. It yeah. really did. It used to be. I mean, that's yeah. That's what it used to be before the Air Force really kind of clamped took down. Over. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Dan's pretty uh, tight-lipped about that. It always <laughs> it always makes me upset. Uh, so, what do you know about the, at Hallman Air Force Base? When, I guess we're going uh, off into the weeds here. Sure. When allegedly some flying saucers were there tampering with ICBMs or so the the urban myth or the legend goes that they were there tampering with ICBMs and uh, what do you think that is again hypothetical and you're not speaking for the yeah, disclaimer you don't represent right. the US government you're representing your own views and this is Tommy's podcast this isn't you know we don't represent China this isn't a probing podcast <laughs> all that being said yeah American flag. All that being said, that's right. That's right. What do you know about the the weather balloons that interacted with the ICBM silos allegedly? (laughs) (laughs) Remember, I can Um, edit anything out. None of this is live. Sure. If any any part you're just like, hey, take that out, I can take it out. So, Uh, yeah, people totally misinterpret my laughter right there. Right? It's. Again, so much actually, Tommy, is is widely publicized anyways. It really is. You can go into the public record and you can research all this. Um, But one of the – so it was white – before it became Holloman Air Force Base, it was White Sands Mm -hmm. testing base basically essentially, White Sands proving ground. And uh, it's it's so important to remember the context when all of this was happening. Now, now you mentioned nice – ICBMs, right? And so ICBMs 
again, depending on the time frame that we need to talk about, if you're talking about World War II, late 1940s, into the 50s, right, Korean War, uh, eventually late 60s, 70s, Vietnam, you know, uh, but certainly late 40s, 50s, even in the 60s, we're not talking about ICBMs. I mean, yeah, ICBMs they, they were didn't, not developed they yet. They did not exist, yeah. Right, so we can't talk about ICBMs in a time context where they never happened, right? It just, sure. so all we had was these huge, expensive B-29 super powerful. David? You're expensive to refuel, right? Sorry, you just nope. you just broke up. There? You just broke up for a second. You there? Yeah. So you're talking about the yeah. the B twenty nines. Yeah. Sorry, it froze up yeah. right there. So B twenty nines. Right. They were the only weapons platform, if you want to call them that, that could transfer from point A to point B, like deliver a payload of of a nuclear bomb. Yeah. That that's all the U.S. had. Yeah. So no ICBMs, nothing like that. We, you know, we barely, I don't even know if you could truly call them missiles in World War II because the V-2 rocket yeah, was V2. designed by Germany in World War yeah, II. So yeah. everything was done with bombers, essentially. Yeah. Uh, nothing like it is today, of course. So you got to look at the payload. You got to look at the transfer system. What, what could carry a nuclear weapon from point A to point B and drop it successfully, hopefully, on the target? Yeah. And, and you know, with an atomic bomb, you just, it's like horseshoes and hand grenades. You just need to get close. Yeah. Yeah. You it's going yeah. to wipe out everything. Right? Yeah. I mean, um, so it depends on the context. If you're talking about that context, certainly no ICBMs. Um, so what did we have? We, we, so, we already had, we really did have high altitude, mylar designed, mylar material weather balloons I, I guess is the best way to to call it but they weren't just simply weather balloons to send up a weather balloon to okay in the upper stratosphere or something you know yeah 15 miles plus you know high and we're not just recording wind speeds and whatnot uh these things literally underneath underneath these mylar balloons which mylar is a material that's almost translucent. I mean, you can almost see through it. And if you put it on the background of an open sky, you're probably not going to see the balloon itself. Hmm. It's not it's not like a hot, colorful, hot air balloon. Not yeah. even close. Yeah. Not even close. But they had to have some way of tracking these hot air balloons up in the sky. So either they were tethered to a really long line, miles of cable, so they could bring them back down. Mm. But also underneath them, they carried a payload. Well, what was the payload? All these really weird spaceship looking saucer boxes yeah. that were made out of metal that carried radar equipment also. Mm -hmm. And we could, with what radar we had back then, you could send a signal up and ping the weather balloon, even though you couldn't see the weather balloon mm -hmm. necessarily on radar, you could only see if you knew where to look, you could see those metal objects. Hmm. And let me tell you, they do. There's some on display out there at um, White Sands Army Air, um, Army Base and out there close to Holman Air Force Base or side by side. Uh, you can see they – I swear they're spaceships. Yeah. I swear they look – exactly like the 1950 science fiction yeah. saucer yeah. spaceships Ooh. little green men yes yeah. they some of them do and some of them look like cigars cigar shaped mm -hmm. i mean you're going so it's 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 not a surprise to me why people would think that it really is if you just look at the evidence there it's i'm not surprised now yeah what do you do with them though that's that's always the key question like what do you do with these hot air balloons we're in the atomic age now yeah we've only got the b29 that is strong enough to carry this heavy payload the um i've been to trinity side i've stood at ground zero oh, really i've seen them yeah it's great they open it up twice a year to the public there in new mexico so you can go hundreds thousands of people go and visit this thing every year but you're going okay that was the first time the atomic bomb was actually initiated then we send two over to japan those things are good size and they're heavy they're so heavy nowadays what they put in an icbm is small mm. in comparison what's so large is that 
rocket that has to go into a lower orbit, you know, yeah. to transverse the globe to be able to hit your target on the other side. Yeah. That's the big part. The payload is small. Yeah. And you can carry multiples yeah. warheads. Yeah, Mervs. Those payloads, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Now, not back then, man. One huge bomb to do the same thing that we can do with more now destruction with one ICBM, you know, that type of thing. Mm. So how do you transport? How do you transport nuclear weapons where the enemy doesn't know that you're transporting them? I don't know. Put them on a balloon. Put them on a balloon. Maybe. Right? Maybe. Maybe. That's a suggestion. So put them on a balloon, send them over. They don't know what to look for. And all of a sudden, you're dropping nuclear bombs. So maybe just tuck that in the back of your head for a little bit and we can play with that a little bit and see. But there wasn't – there was no other way. Yeah. I mean – yeah. To transport well, the weapons, perhaps. Japan so. tried to firebomb the U.S. with uh, incendiary bombs strapped to balloons. I think they sent like 100,000 over the Pacific Ocean. I think one made it. Yeah. I believe it actually killed someone like a year after the war. And it's the <laughs> only, yeah, aside from Pearl Harbor, it's like the only mainland uh, casualty of the war. I think so. Yeah, I think, so. I think it was like 1946 or something. Is in like right. Seattle or something. Someone was in the woods and like an incendiary bomb went off. <laughs> but it's it's not really a far fetched idea. I mean, Germany yeah. was using hot air balloons and stuff too. For uh, we were using hot air balloons back in the Civil War. Yeah, and literally, oh, yeah. we the North and the South, whoever was using them, would literally would drop the equivalent of a hand grenade and take pot shots. Yeah, at the enemy. Oh yeah, using hot air balloons. So it's it's not that far fetched in one sense. Now the question is, but what about the Roswell incident? Yeah, so right, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, how does this all tie in? So. Yeah, so, so um, I had a friend on the other day, and we were talking about this, and we actually kind of came, kind of did some research during the podcast and made a connection. So we were talking about like, what if you know, let's say fireworks are illegal, right? And let's say sure. I'm here at my house. Say it's just me and some friends. And we, we get a huge bottle rocket, whatever, Roman candle, whatever, you know, whatever just right. a bunch of, you know, kids are doing. And we fire it off in the sky, big boom, maybe break some windows, right? 10, 20 minutes are going to pass. And eventually, actually, I don't even know why I'm using this as a hypothetical. I vividly remember my freshman year of high school, <laughs> me and my friends shooting bottle rockets at each other. We we'd like use trash can lids and sh- and like then we'd go back and hide in the garage and we'd wait for a couple minutes and like sure enough you'd see a squad car roll by and you know they didn't know exactly where it was but they knew it was one of the houses in the cul-de-sac so you know they come close and there's a little bit of time delay so right time delay right. in a little bit of a they get within the area spatially so the first nuclear test was on July 16th, 1945, Alamogordo, New Mexico, as you know, Trinity test site. Roswell was eight days shy of exactly two years later. Mm-hmm. August, or sorry, so July 16th, 1945, July 8th, 1947. Correct. So time delay, right? Correct, correct. Al- distance between Alamogordo and Roswell. 117.2 miles of the Correct. of the 24,000 mile across earth. Correct. 2 years almost to the day, 117 miles and the only place, the place where we set off the very first nuke, not Hiroshima, not Nagasaki, <laughs> but the very first one, the metaphorical Roman candle. Right. And not only that, but as you said, where the the 509th was stationed, the only atomic bomb wing, not just in the United States. At that time, it was the the U.S. Army Air Forces. This is before the Air Force. Correct. So it was not only the only one in the United States, it was the only one in the world. The only atomic Air Force wing was also right there. So it's two almost two years later to the day, only 117 miles apart. It's where the first nuke was, and it's where the nuclear wing is. It is kind of weird that, again, this is all allegedly, but it is kind of weird that that's where a flying saucer would visit, isn't it? It's the, it is. It's the squad it car. It's the squad car rolling by, and it's like, hey, <laughs> humans have been killing each other for eternity, whatever. Y'all just unleashed the nuclear bomb. I'm like, okay, this is civilizations make this jump. It's like it's like puberty for a civilization. You've hit the, 
you know now you're not just an angry little kid now you're an angry kid but you have muscle and a growth spurt right so now so now humanity is we got this little temper tantrum but now we don't we don't have to throw dumb bombs or muskets now we're you know what did Oppenheimer say the power heretofore reserved for the gods like right. that's so what are your thoughts on that is that am I drawing too much of I am I anthropomorphizing it am I making sure, too much sure. of a, an easy argument but and I'm a big seem... science fiction Star Trek fan oh, so, yeah, and stuff all, too so. and so uh, the big thing is when the Federation makes first contact with a new species new planet according to their guidelines they're only able to make first contact once a civilization achieves warp speed okay like the ability to travel faster than the speed of light you know yeah. that type of thing otherwise yeah. they're supposed to be hands off yeah. and so that's kind of the same theory which i'm not surprised because i i, I know that science fiction has influenced more this story than this story has influenced science fiction hmm more has been written about it just kind of kind of a historical background if you will and then more has been written about it that it has nothing to do whatsoever with that particular um, incident in mm. the military it's it's quite interesting I, I i appreciate your analogy there of <laughs> oh nuclear yeah, they're you know one Fire step gun. forward yeah 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 whoop, whoop. yeah yeah, yeah. And it, yeah um, it's, it's almost like hey if the kids are in the front yard and they want to smack each other and play tackle football or use slingshots right. and hit each other occasionally they break a window but like okay. hey whatever hands off that's they're in their yard let the kids beat each other up whatever but now you're shooting off bottle rockets that's beyond right. the yard beyond right. the earth and <laughs> what and what okay well now you're endangering other homes right. other species right. Right. and it's like okay now and it wasn't it was only a couple years later that we did shoot one into space uh starfish prime we shot a 1.4 megaton <laughs> into low earth <laughs> orbit and we're like let's see what it does and yeah. we didn't even know about emp uh, uh, effects then that's how we yeah. learned we're like hey we just knocked out all the power in like honolulu i was like okay yeah. noted <laughs> but that's now we're and we were planning on nuking the moon to show uh to i guess one up the soviets so it's like Again, it's kind of like, hey, if you guys want to beat each other up in your own yard, that's fine. But now you're shooting bottle rockets at the neighbors. And it's like, now humanity is like, hey, we got a bomb. What's the first thing we did? First, we wiped out our enemies. And what's the next thing we did? Throw it into space. Like, that's right. Now the cops come and they're like, okay, we're not, like you said, hands off. We're not, we're not here to interact with you. We're not here to um, inhibit or accelerate your growth as a species into, you know, let's just say a, a, a planetary or a member of the planet or galactic community right right it's you guys you can do whatever you want there we're not going to stop you we, we didn't stop you from nuking hiroshima in japan like we're not going to stop you we're not going to stop you from doing uh, atmospheric tests ocean tests ground tests and underground tests but now you're starting to come into space you can't do that so that that's I don't know that's kind of my theory and again it's all crazy but you know when you get to this level of stuff you kind of have to suspend normal you know we're talking about crazy things but like it kind of makes sense that's the quantum leap you get hydrogen or yeah, now we have hydrogen bombs the cops show up and they're like okay here are the ground rules you know so when right. you get a car right. your parents are like yeah you can drive around here's the curfew you know like right so yeah well, I, I tell you what, um, try to connect this to a little bit for you. Yeah. It was early summer, 1997. I get a phone call in my office. I have no idea who this cat is. I have no clue. Um, he calls and he's letting me know that it's going to be the 50th anniversary of the alleged Roswell incident, which would be July 1997. That would have been the 50 year anniversary there and he's produced this book he already produced another book it was published by the headquarters for united states air force and so he's filling this in on me he sends me a, a copy and stuff and i've got it's called the roswell report case closed and i've read through it and really i think i had heard growing up at some point this idea of the roswell probably because i watched star trek quite honestly and so after i get done with talking to this guy on the phone i go now wait a minute all of the histories that were written 
from that time period, the whole time period that Army Airfield was out there in Roswell were transferred over to my office long before I even got there and took over the history position. Hmm. And they're in my vault. And so again, I, I've completed my work or whatever, and I've got some time. So I go into my vault, make sure all the other doors locked. I, I block out the, you know, the blinds, turn off the lights. I don't want anybody looking. And I'm, I'm going through, and I go, oh, there's that history. Oh, there's that history. So I'm pulling volumes off the shelf, and I'm just reading through it. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Now again, it's been years since I've done this, okay? So I don't remember everything. But I'm reading through and I start to see some some blackout stuff, like someone had gone through there and edited it, so to speak, and this, that, and the other. But it just so happens I have that copy, but I had, there was the original copy as well. And so I was able to kind of compare and contrast these two things. And so I'm just skimming through, reading, reading. I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Oh, that's, that's, that's kind of interesting. Now, this captain that called me, um, and because all these things had been declassified, mind you, they they for a couple of years at least or so they 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 researched all this material. So what I had was again duplicated somewhere else, and so they had access to this as well. And so I'm reading about the nurse, the doctors, the so-called whatever, but the thing that doesn't line up at all is the dates are different Hmm. now now my two copies are the same what i mean is it does not correspond with 19 for july 1947 really these incidents that people have put together that somehow surround the roswell incident or take place at least 10 years afterwards okay and so you've got all these different incidents that people have just lumped together with the Roswell incident. It makes a much better story, quite yeah. honestly. Yeah. And and if you're from you know a U.S. military government side point of view, you're going, you know what? I know there are people paid right now in our government to come up with titles and ideas for what are we going to call this top secret project that we're doing? Well, heck, the people out in Roswell, New Mexico, they're calling it space invaders, you know, yeah. space aliens, and all this other stuff. Let's just go with that. Yeah. They're going to run with it. Why do we need to come up with something to kind of put a top secret label on something we don't want the public to know right now? Yeah. But it had nothing to do with actual aliens, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it's really quite interesting to, you know, when I read through that stuff, I'm going, they're not even, I mean, 10 years is a huge leap just in logic when it goes to make that connection that, oh, this all happened. No, no, this all happened back here. Mm. Here's the evidentiary proof of that. And so we have trails. We have document trails for that. We have evidentiary trails of all of that. So it's pretty interesting. His book kind of helps summarize all that. Um, again, I was able to read a lot of the actual um, histories of that time period. I just, fascinating. I mean, if I want to, I could probably write a book about it myself just for fun please, and, please do. and send it out. You know, please that do. would be, that would be interesting. But again, think about this. No doubt the U S government over the years, even since then, you know, they come up with these crazy names for, okay, we're going to call it this, but it's really this. And we're trying to mislead not sure. only our own population, but we have to mislead. Sure. The bad guys, the, the people who want to steal our technology and our information and get it one up on us. I'm telling you, when the public generates it themselves and we do nothing to try to stop it or we use reverse psychology to kind of encourage it in a yeah, way. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 of course not. It's not aliens. Well, what is that going to do? Yeah. It's going to continue to yeah. continue that. Oh, yeah, it's aliens. Um well, I tell you what, the 50th anniversary came and it was crazy. My phone was ringing off the hook. I'm trying to answer questions about the Roswells and I'm going, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. What are you talking about? The 19, I wasn't even a twinkle in my dad's eye. Yeah. My grandpa had just got back from fighting in World War II. Yeah. And you want to ask me about the Roswells in 1947. What do you got? Right? I mean, just call after call. And if you've ever seen pictures or visited Roswell, New Mexico, I've been there plenty of times. Um, that is a huge tourist mm. industry there. Mm. Without aliens in Roswell, there it's is nothing. no Roswell. Yeah, it's nothing. It's there's no reason to visit Roswell, New Mexico. Yeah. There really isn't. It, yeah. 
But I've been there. I've been to the museums. I've been on seats. Oh, and I go, no, no, that's not right. Oh, yeah. no, that's not right. Where'd they get that green, funny looking guy? Yeah. No, that didn't happen. So um, it's, it's interesting though. Go ahead. It's interesting. Yeah. No, I mean, it's definitely advantageous to, yeah. you know, black projects. Mm-hmm. And if, if the people think it's a UFO, let them think it's a UFO. Why not? Because it's just going to, you're not going to be suspecting, hey, do they have, do they have, because what are the U.S. corp? Do they have a black triangle that can evade radar? No, it's UFO. Well, it's kind of like in World War II, the British uh, started sowing seeds. They made up a rumor and kind of spread it into Germany. And it was, that's where the whole myth of eat, eat carrots to have good eyesight. Mm. They said that their airmen uh, and their I guess their sky watchers had all been eating carrots, and that's how they could see the German planes coming in. It's because they didn't want the Germans to know that they had radar. Right. So it's better right. for you to believe in some urban myth than it is to go, wait, do they actually have something? Because if it's just they're eating carrots, then it's like, ah, you know, whatever. But it's if it's they have radar, then all of a sudden you become a target for sabotage. And Correct. so if, if the people and by relation... Uh, other state actors think that it's a UFO. Well, that's that's perfect. You don't want them to become looking at your stealth bomber. You go, oh yeah, we don't know what that is too. You know, that's definitely not aliens. Like, thank and what's God. a UFO? Yeah. Unidentified flying object. And if I, the layperson, don't know the what civilian it is. population, I'm looking at something that just flew over my head or dropped in my backyard. In 1947, Roswell, New Mexico, Mr. Podunk Farmer there yeah. going, what the? <laughs> yeah, what is, what that? is that? It's a UFO. Yeah. Because yeah. he don't know what it is either. Yeah. No, no, that's another, that's another thing that never gets really addressed is that a UFO is, is subjective. It cannot, right. it cannot be incorrect. Right. It is, if, I don't know what plane that was. That's a UFO to me. Um, right, right. Yeah, so something I... I an idea I always talk about is like, so think about Operation Paperclip, right? We brought over tons and tons of Nazi scientists, you know, the mo- most notable Werner von Braun, but we also brought over chemists. Um, I can never forget the the, the famous Otto Ambrose. We brought over T- Walter Dornberger. Uh, we brought over all these guys and we had them out in bases in Texas and Nevada and we kind of quarantined them to their own little places because we were like, these are not the war criminals. Like, we're not letting them out in a society. Correct. And uh, yep. we, we'd bug all of their little places where they lived, so we'd listen to them, make sure they weren't sabotaging. But we needed them because it wasn't just enough to have the V2s. We had, we had to know how they worked. And obviously, Werner von Braun eventually headed up NASA, got us to the moon. So, I mean, all in all, it was a great success. And everyone that has a moral problem with it, it's like the idea... Of it's if we have them, we know the Russians don't have them. That's the only Correct. guarantee. So, Correct. but one thing I think about is like, imagine it's 1947, right? Or mm-hmm. just say whatever, say 1950. Oh, no, no, let's go. It's right after World War II. So let's say 46, 47. Not even UFO part. Imagine we just got finished beating the Nazis, right? Sure. How many Americans just died over there? World War II, the world was at war, 80, including civilians, 85 million dead on the upper high end of estimates, and it ended with atomic warfare, all right? Right, correct. All right, so that just happened. And it's 1946, 47, so human flight has only existed for 45 years. So let's take that into account. Right, 1902? Not talking about hot air balloons, but just... Sure, sure. Yeah. So, That's fair. Yeah. So, yeah. So let's say, uh, you know, like heavier than air flight. All right. Sure. So let's say, so that's two things. Just finished beating the Nazis. I mean, just finished beating the Nazis. Most of the guys that have come back, the, mo- the baby boomers aren't even being born yet. Right. Flight's only been around for 45 years. Right. Okay. Right. Lastly, the, they're in secret bases. A lot of them are, it's completely classified. And this is back when who would ever question Uncle Sam? Right. There's just there is a di- it's a different, you know, I just remember even now it passed away. But even talking to my grandparents, it was just a general like you don't question Uncle Sam. Right. Well, and patriotism was very high. Yeah. Back then it's too. Just, I mean, yeah. Africa, again, again, the sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you get to start painting this picture. 
Now, what if you went up to just any old, you know, maybe some guy comes back from, you know, he's back working on whatever. He works in Detroit. He's working on cars, whatever. He's whatever. You're a farmer, good, you know, red-blooded American, just came back from, you know, beating the Nazis and the Japanese. And what if I, from the future, could just, you know, come back and, or not even, let's say I just was out at a base in Nevada or Texas, I believe it was Fort Bliss. Let's say I come back and say, you're never going to believe it. I saw Nazis. I saw Nazis <laughs> talking with American generals, with Curtis LeMay, with a young guy named uh, Kennedy. Nazi guys out there. Where were they? They were at a secret base. No, 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 no. Uncle Sam's not telling you about this one. It's a secret base. What are they doing? They're building rockets. Well, why are they doing that? Because they're going to go to the moon. Mm-hmm. You've only been flying for 45. No, but they want to go to the moon. You're going to put me in a straight jacket, right? Right. You, you're telling right. me we're going to the moon and Uncle Sam's lying to us about a secret base and they have Nazis of all people. But that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Right. That's it's, right. It's, it, is, it is stranger than fiction. <laughs> it is. It's like that's exact. So the way I always look at it is like if if that happened and if you would put yourself in that time period, it's like the strangest thing you could ever imagine. It's like that's actually what happened. I then look at just current day and I think whatever's like the strangest thing I could imagine Who's to say that there's not going to be a podcast in 2100 where, like, imagine it's 2020, you know? That's right. You're doing That's a podcast right. and you're talking about, you guys are going, aliens couldn't possible exist. Like, little did they know. So that's <laughs> that's what I think of is, like, what is this, the insanely just ridiculous far out there, like, ooh, but it's, like, in 100 years, it's, like, people are just, like, shaking their heads like they had no idea. Like, so... I, I I try to look at aliens or UFOs. I try to look at it just, you know, as rationally as you can. I try to look at it as like, what would be the actual um, incentive to keeping it quiet? Well, you don't need to go on the whole, oh, the public can't handle it. No, there's a very real incentive. It's technology. Just like we keep uh, stealth quiet, you know, Death sure. 17, just like we, sure. the Manhattan Project. I mean, 150,000 sure. people worked on it. One that only one thousand of them. So that's another thing is people. It's like a hundred. It's not that one hundred and fifty thousand people worked on it and didn't know what they were working on. One hundred and fifty thousand people worked on it, and they didn't know they were working on it. They didn't even know that they were being compartmentalized. Correct. It's one thing to know you're compartmentalized. It's another thing that they didn't even like energy production in Tennessee. It was like what they had no idea that they were helping build a fission bomb. It was just. 1944 we're just doing whatever but like and, and yeah. that's the other thing too is yeah I, I, I don't know what well i mean I, I wish i could have a time machine that would go for yeah i mean that's just as fictional as anything sure, else sure. but what, what what will they say yeah years from now 100 years from now you know a thousand years from now whatever um i, I always I often wonder about the why do we want to believe in aliens from some other part of the galaxy whether known or unknown or uh, i don't know why does human why are we so caught up in this what what caused that i mean i'm not going to find an answer to it i know that already but we are fascinated by that and i'm not talking about all the coops yeah that um just recently what was it um there area, was it just a few months ago they the were out area there area 51 and, raid oh oh my gosh yeah, that was what they don't realize is that those mps and contractors would have shot them dead if they crossed that line they it's, like, have, it's like all those, those people are idiots man all those people that were like <laughs> you see the memes where it's like the u.s government wouldn't kill ten thousand of us oh yeah <laughs> but here's the other thing here's the other thing where they were at it's miles before they would even actually come to a structure yeah. that might house something yeah. of importance. Yeah. Miles. Yeah. They literally have no clue what they're what they're Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it, it's set up the way it's set up so that you can't just run it. It's in the middle of the Nevada test range so right. that there's even if you break the the even if you get past the perimeter, you still got 150 miles on foot through the <laughs> desert. <laughs> like it's designed that way for a reason. It's, you know, with the with the stealth project, they they were flying 
men and women um, out of uh, the Las Vegas airport on airplane. And yeah. this, again, this has been, this is all documentary oh, yeah, stuff. No, so, yeah, yeah, the, uh, the Janet but Airlines. They, but yeah, the airlines, though, all the windows were sealed, blocked out, so they couldn't see even out the windows while they were flying. Uh-huh. And for the longest time, uh, they didn't know exactly where they were going either. Yeah. All they knew is that, okay, I got in an airplane in the desert, and when I got off the same airplane, I'm still in the desert, but I don't know what desert I'm in. Yeah. It is far, you know, like, whatever. And they may have taken different flight patterns and flight time to kind of mix it up in their mind psychologically too. Absolutely. Uh, but it happened all the time, and it's called the Tonopah Test Range. That, in actuality, Area 51 was a civilian creation there was no there is no area 51 it might be area 52 but there is no area 51 and i don't even know how that caught on honestly you're just going where's this area 51 i searched my records for it too because i knew somehow that was gonna come into play with this roswell incident and stuff i'm like there's no mention back then of an area 51 there's no what is mentioned is the that roswell army airfield that you mentioned you got White Sands Proving Grounds yeah. out there. Groom Lake. It's, right? Yeah. You know, huge. This test range and everything. You're going, that's what's mentioned. None of this so-called Area 51. And I think that's more sci-fi yeah. than anything else. It really is. I think I think they probably just let the public run with it. It's, Why not? The only Why explanation not? I've heard is like, the because the Nevada test site is massive. It's, it is. It's, it's, yeah. it's like, isn't it like larger than Rhode Island? It's It's like... It's the biggest government parcel, but I think it's bigger than, I want to say it's, I think I heard it's bigger than Connecticut. It's insane. It might be. It's, it's, if anything, it's close to the size approximately, let's say, for argument's sake, uh, of even the White Sands testing range. And the White Sands testing range, basically the southern end of Albuquerque, New Mexico, all the way down into Texas at the northern end of Fort Bliss Army uh, army base basically i mean it's yeah, miles yeah. Oh, of it's insane and well again new, new mexico though is the fifth largest state in the entire united states yeah Nevada is pretty large too being out there who wants to go out in the middle of that desert but i mean they've got the wide space it's government controlled for the most part yeah. and well it's secluded i mean yeah. it's perfect yeah perfect for these things well yeah no it's absolutely yeah there's no conspiracy behind beyond that it's just like it's a huge plate parcel of land it's not valuable land it's not like hey we could be putting you know valuable commerce and industry there it's like it's it's in the middle of no there's mountains everywhere it's Mm -hmm. you know so that that blocks vision there's again desert if you're a foreign saboteur like good luck surviving in death valley like you know that's right not that's even right. security just good luck you know, right? right if you that's do survive right. you're gonna get bit by a snake it's but, but yeah so the only explanation i ever saw was that when they had this huge when they started to take over this huge plot of land it was it was literally just there was nothing woo woo about it. it was just they literally just mapped it out as a grid sure and it just so happens sure. that groom lake is in grid 51 Right. Said it was. Yeah. That, that's all it is. It could just as exactly. easily said it's it's arbitrary. It could air, just as easily be known as Area Thirty. Like it's. It um, is. One, uh, one of the times when I was in the history office, and this is after the fiftieth or around maybe around the same time as the fiftieth anniversary of the Roswell incident. I got a phone call, and these two older gentlemen came in the office. So they face to face came in the office again. We shut the door. Men in black. Uh, not men in black. I was surprised. They they were they were older gentlemen, and I got a chance to interview them one on one, basically, hmm. uh, as we were in there. So the three of us just sat down, real casual um, environment there, and I'm not going to tell you the name because I can't remember the name of this the one guy, but this was the guy that the government put in charge of the of the Blue Book reports. Doctor J. So Allen Hynek. Go ahead. Dr. J. Allen Hynek. That sounds very familiar, that's right? A, that's his name. Well, so he was in charge of the Blue Book investigations. And then the other gentleman was um, Joseph Stapp. Now, Joseph Stapp, a retired colonel, if I remember right, and one of the things he was famous for is since White Sands was a testing base, this cat sits on a rocket-powered chair, and it, the chair was – 
like a wooden, I don't know if it was a wooden chair, or metal chair, right? He's, he straps himself to this thing. It's a long train track looking device. They light that um, sucker yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He breaks the sound barrier on land while basically really not in any type of special yeah. outfit or gear. When it stops at the other end of this track, it's a water break. So again, Mach 1, boom, flies down this track. He breaks the record, okay? <laughs> he hits the water break. He was so jacked up after that. His eyeball was basically hanging out of his eye, broken bones, bruised all up, face all swollen. I mean, this guy, I don't know how he lived. And as an older guy, you could kind of tell this cat had been through the ringer. Oh, Someone yeah. ran over him with the boss, backed up, ran over, backed up, ran yeah. over. I mean, he, but he was still kicking at that time. Yeah. Well, they want to have a conversation about the Roswell incident. I'm oh. like, what? How do, what? Because they were there connected or close to that time frame. And the guy that was investigating all this Blue Book incidents, basically what he did is when people from all over New Mexico would call some government number, call the base, whatever it was. Hey, I think I see lights out here. I think there's aliens. I think there's this or whatever. He was the one that would go out to the actual locations and investigate it to the best of their ability and record their findings. Mm -hmm. And in not one incident did he tell me there was little green men from Mars yeah. that came down and landed. Here's what he did see. And it, again, this is well documented. Yes, there were plenty all – It's what's strange to me though, this is the strange part, is – these incidents of launching these balloons up and literally having one or two of these atomically correct dummies, if you will, to the best specification of technology we had at the time, launch these suckers up in the air, throw them out of the, the balloon, and watch them hit the ground. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know they did that. Yeah. What are you possibly trying to test? Do you think a human being is going to go splat when you send them that far up and they hit the ground? Well, yeah, they're testing parachutes, you know, as far as, all right, how strong the material that, you know, all the, uh, and then, of course, inside these dummies, they have all kinds of recording devices, scientific recording devices, whatever it was, pressure, heart rate, you name it, all this other stuff. It, to the best that they could try to simulate as closely to a human body, what would it experience? if the parachute failed or if it's this type of parachute. And so they're, these things are flying all over New Mexico. They're not, I don't know why, they don't seem to be restricted to just the White Sands <laughs> testing ground. And so farmer over here, civilian over here, what? All of a sudden, they don't see the balloon, but then they see this thing fall from the sky. They come up on it. What the heck is that? <laughs> What are you going to say in 1947 yeah. if you happen to see these – or even the 1950s? When was – wait a minute. When was H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds produced, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Green Martian – you know, all this stuff coming together. It sure it, – it makes a great story. Yeah. But they have some of these – um, at least they did at the time. They had a couple of these on display at the uh, White Sands – History Museum, Air and Space History Museum there in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Uh, while I was the historian out there, I built a display separate from them, but they have those in the museum. Mm. You could probably go online and see the pictures of these things. I don't know how you look at this and go, that's an alien. Mm. I, I None of the pictures, the actual pictures I've seen in the history documents and everything that I even had in my office, they, I don't know how you make that leap from, okay, that's an alien. Now, again, if you use the strictest definition of the word, that's alien to you because it doesn't look like you. It's foreign. Sure. It's different. Yeah, it's, it's alien. It's alien. I get that. But this guy investigated all that. And he going, David, that's – there was none of that. You, you've heard, you may have heard stories about, oh, the lights in the sky, they're swamp gas. And I go, it's a desert. There's no swamp yeah. in the desert, right? Yeah. I'm going, but I've, I've driven Southern California. I was stationed at Edwards Air Force Base, got stationed, restationed at Holman Air Force Base. 
I lived in the desert most of my adult life, and I tell you what, the sun sets out there, the sun rises, the lights in the sky that you see sometimes when you're out in the middle of the desert, you really can't tell what they are. I mean, you really can to say they play tricks on you at times, I agree with that. I mean, sure. just seeing different light phenomena, it's not the aurora borealis, the northern lights, of course, but you just go, well, that's really interesting. It's, mm. it's reflection of something or this, that, mm. and the other. And he was able to prove all that, that none of that stuff that was called in during those times were actual aliens. And then you mm. got, like I said, this Joseph Stapp guy just blowing records left and right. Um, he was living during that time period as well. I don't know if they're even alive today. I mean, this was almost 20 years ago since I've been out. Now, this is back in 1997 that I talked to them. Um, but it's, I think part of this mystery reason why it's still a mystery is because Holloman Air Force Base has had that rich, deep history of everything. Enoch the Chimp was trained out there and he was the one that was launched in outer space before the first human, you know, astronaut was. Yeah. And they still, when I was there, they still had that test facilities, buildings and stuff. And let me tell you, there were still protests going on during that time frame because, you know, we were abusing all the social justice warriors of that time period. You weren't even called that. But they were protesting, oh, cruelty to animals. And I'm like, I don't know about you, but I'd rather send a chimp up there first before I go up there. Yeah. We don't know who's going to. Anyways, Holland Air Force has all this, all this wonderful history that a lot of it is still uh, somewhat classified because of the weapon system platforms and everything that they have there. And now it's the F it's, it's a premier F 22 base. Mm. So stealth fighter has been retired years ago. It got replaced with a fighter wing again, with the F 22s and a lot of those, that weapon platform is still classified as far as what it really can and can't do. And that's mm. fine. Mm. I mean, we need, we need that type of protection in yeah. this country. We yeah. don't need to let all of our enemies know what we can and can't do, but yeah. uh, really interesting. It's, yeah. There's a lot that has happened out there yeah. during that time period. What do you think that they are testing out there now? So let's not even, let's, sure. let's bring sure. it, bring it, no pun intended, bring it back down to earth and, because yeah, you're right. You mean, dude, the flying saucers, the aliens, they're they're so fun. That's what it is. It, is they're fun. Is. They're fantastic. They are they are awesome. Like they are. It's almost like I heard a quote that was like, "We want to believe in UFOs because it's almost sort of like a like a patriarchal longing. You want mm. there to be some other civilization that's got it figured out, right? Yeah. You want there to be someone that's got their we you know we cured aging. We have hyperdimensional travel. We so right. it's almost like a sort of longing for like someone to show you the way. Sure. But it's sure. also, it's, it's, it's an escape from the mundane, you know, it it's is nothing, you know, yeah. having heating and air conditioning and modern antibiotics and internet, like it's all great and stuff, but yeah, used to it. But man, some aliens, like I, there's, it's the great unknown, but yeah. So to pull it back down oh. i think i think they're still testing weather balloons out there yeah no i, I know they are actually they're so from time to time they're still testing weather balloon technology has gotten better over the years but right when i was getting out um the stealth fighter had not been retired yet and i they were they were using a lot of the the new drone systems at that time and the, and the drone systems at that time uh probably were you know the the ancestors to what we have now but they were basically just the intelligence gathering type of drones as opposed to hey let's strap that roman candle bottle rocket yeah. on the wings and use it as a weapon platform also which yeah. that's what we have today Eventually, too yeah. apparently so they they started getting in all that i know it's probably blossomed since the time um, i've been there um but i think too the one of the missions of holloman air force base at the time was not just not just having the, it was the Air Force's mission as well, you know, having air superiority, having the best technology and equipment to be able to carry out the defense of this country and and our allies. Um, But we would train 
other countries there as well. I mean, for the longest time, they had the German Air Force there at Holland Air Force Base. Really? And so the Germans come over and you had this large German population, uh, which was really great for the economy there. Uh, you had some really good restaurants. And if you like German food, you know, give me the bratwurst. Let yeah. me tell you. Yeah. Just, that does it for me. But we were training training uh, joint missions and stuff like that with the German Air Force. Um, there was uh, other countries, uh, one in particular that we were training that was not widely publicized at all, but we were helping them uh, train their fighter pilots um, so that they could defend their country against another aggressor that they uh, were trying to break away from if you will or mm-hmm. something like that so they're an ally again just an ally but it wasn't widely publicized um the, the air system that they were flying and training in was one that i had flown in when i was at edwards air force base it's not what i did full time but i got a chance to ride in the same type of weapon system out there as a one of those incentive flight type deals mm-hmm. but i i tell you what um <clears throat> I think the again I've been out for a long time, so I think the main thing is is it's that F twenty two weapon platform, mm. uh, an amazing amazing piece of technology. The thing could do about Mach three, unclassified Mach three without even breaking the kicking in the afterburners. You think so, the F twenty two can do Mach three? Uh, we can do a lot more than F three. But what I'm saying is, here's the difference. Well, so you... the stealth fighter, for example, right? Let's make a quick comparison. Stealth fighter. It, it was not built or designed and could not, without maybe gravity, <laughs> break the sound. It couldn't go Mach 1. Yeah. As soon as you break the sound barrier, that creates a distortion wave that now with technology, that could be picked up on radar. Yeah. And so you can track these distortion waves with the right equipment. Yeah. And so if you have a weapons platform that it has stealth-like capability, but can essentially go about Mach 3 without even kicking in the afterburners, which suggests it can go a lot faster than Mach 3. So even though it's breaking sound barriers and stuff, it still has stealth-like capability. So it, it's limited, but what I'm saying, it's just, it's an amazing platform. I just think about that for yeah. a second. You got, you got the, the advances from the U-2, the SR-71, yeah, you got the stealth fighter and the B-2 stealth bomber, but then you've got, you make a huge leap in technology from those weapon platforms to the F-22, the F-23 Joint Strike Fighters. F- it's yeah. just, it's a huge leap in technology. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? I, do, I mean, stealth capability, obviously we've had it for 20, 30 years in a sense, right? Mm. Um, but to be able to go that fast and not create like a heat signature radar mm. before even kicking in afterburners to go so much faster, <laughs> it, it we couldn't achieve that with the stealth technology we had back then. Now we can. So It's, it's not 100%, mind you, but it's, yeah. it's pretty close. So you're saying that the F-22 can go that fast? I thought the F-22 could only go like Mach 1. F-22 can go about plus Mach 3. Let's put it that way. If it needs to, it can. The F-22 can go Mach 3. If it needs to, it can. I've never heard that. Really? It take You take uh, an F-15 weapons platform, the F-15 engines... Those general dynamic engines can accelerate while going vertical, straight mm-hmm. up. Now, you, you enhance that technology with that weapon system, it's easy to be able to go Mach 3. It really is. It's not That's not a barrier that we cannot break nowadays. Yeah. But how long can you sustain it, right? Sure. I mean, you, you can't do Mach 3 in a combat situation. Sure. The G-forces that would be pulled in you. an actual dogfight, it would kill a human being. So... But I want to run and get away. Just, I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm kicking it. If I kick in the afterburners, I'm going even faster. So it'd be interesting. Yeah. See, stealth fighters can't do that. It's yeah. not a fight. It's not a real fight. It's really a small 
bummer. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. all it was without yeah. afterburners. Yeah. Ben Rich said the reason they called it the F-117 instead of the B-117, they said it was purely pilots' egos. Pilots sure. were like, I'm not a bomber. I'm a fighter pilot. So they're like, fine, we'll call it the F. Like, But they're like, for all intents and purposes, they're like, it's the B-117. It is. But apparently all these hotshot fighters were like, I'm not going to fly this. I'm not going to go into this program. And they needed these top guns. And they're like, we got to lure these big, we got to lure these guys in here. But they've all got, you know, egos. Yeah. So they're like, hey, you know what? It's the F-117. And then they're all like, all right, yeah, I'll do it. And I was like, oh, whatever. Um, you know, I, I was back in, uh, we were living in, Las Cruces, New Mexico, before moving here, and uh, this was more about three, you know, up to three years ago. So, kind of in the the uh, mid two thousands to the mid two thousand fifteen, you know, kind of time frame in there. And I tell you what, I can still hear sonic booms from time to time, knowing that the F twenty two was at home in Air Force Base. And Las Cruces is about a forty five minute drive to home and Air Force Base across the White Sands testing mm-hmm. ground. And it sits, if you look at a you know, Google Maps or something or Google Earth, and it's in a valley, essentially. Where, you know, it's got mountain ranges on each side. And so it's somewhat cushioned from sonic boom activity. But I tell you what, I, I could hear them every now and then. My wife would go, what it was that? And I'm like, that was an F-22. That was an F-22. I'm like, from here I go from here. I'm telling you. Either that or they just did a flyby of an F-22 over the local, you know, New Mexico State University football game or something. Yeah. And I, yeah which they wouldn't have broken the sound barrier to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. without permission. <laughs> yeah. The thing is that they, um, is that we export the F-35. We don't export the F-22. We let yep. we let our allies have F thirty five South Korea, uh, German I think UK. UK does yep. We don't yep. let anyone touch the F twenty two. No, it's and you know again I'm not the spokesperson for all this or the sure. repository of knowledge for it, but it just I understand a little bit maybe, and it's a fraction I'm sure of what people actually know, and that's fine. It, but and that and, and again at home in Air Force Base. Uh, prior to the F-117 being stationed there, it it had F-15 fighter squadrons. And so they did a lot of testing with the F-15 at Holloman Air Force Base. And that was probably the time when my my father, actually, that was his first base when he was in the Air Force. He oh. was stationed at Holloman Air Force Base. So they had the F-15s there, and they were doing things. They were, they were at the time trying to take an F-15, go vertical, continue to accelerate i mean the the only other craft that i'm personally aware of that can actually accelerate while going vertical from the earth was the space Space shuttle shuttle. when it was launching and it would go about mach 25 when you calculate the actual speed it would take to break the gravity of earth to get into orbit well so you got this f-15 that's do not not mach 25 mind you but it's accelerating while going vertical and it's an air intake engine. It's not solid fuel. Yeah. So it's to me, it's not a big stretch yeah. that this F-22 can, can really do that. But they were taking a missile. Yeah, 1985. Yeah. And they were trying to, can I target lock a satellite, a satellite in orbit and actually shoot it down? And they now, did. they missed a couple of times, but I'm pretty sure they hit one for sure. They did in 1985. Yeah. It, was yeah. only, it was the only F-15 they... they had a special name as the f-15 celestial eagle which yeah. is just such a cool name but it's yeah because it had that big anti-sat missile on there yeah and they zoom climbed they fired it off yeah, and he nailed it um yeah. so do you think that they um you said the the space shuttle could land out at uh yeah. Or is it White Sands or Holloman? White Sands. White yeah. Sands. Yeah. Is that where the x-37b lands do you know? You tell me about the X thirty seven. X thirty seven B is that little like uh, it looks like the space shuttle. Uh, I'm not sure. I really don't know. I okay. mean, I ultimately I don't know. Uh, when I was stationed at Holloman Air Force Base, uh, what, what's the civilian space agent SpaceX? Right, SpaceX. Uh, um, they had a. I flew over it when I was at Edwards Air Force Base. They have a flight line out there and maybe they were using that as well it could but you have to understand that white sands it's not a ready able landing strip okay like they don't 
they don't have you know foundational buildings and whatnot there and it's ready 24 7 that's not what that is they they would have to go out there and prepare it and the space shuttle only landed once there again to, to basically test whether or not the space shuttle could land there. i mean that's a pretty big test yeah. multi-million dollar aircraft right just to test but it tore up the space shuttle so bad hmm. Now, here's the thing. It gets torn up when it comes back into orbit anyways. But then you land on essentially a dry lake bed that's made out of gypsum. And gypsum is that crystal that's a different type of crystal than just sand crystal. And it tore everything. Not only did it tear up the space shuttle even more, but it also kind of tore up the other equipment that was nearby Mm. to help support the landing of the space shuttle. So they only did it once. Mm. They haven't done it since then. Mm. But they know if they had to an emergency, they could they could use that. And now when I was there, again as being the historian, one of the one of the things I recorded was there was a unit at Holman Air Force Base that was responsible to be on standby any time that the space shuttle was in orbit and coming and was going to come back down because there was alternate landing sites in the world, yeah. not just in the yeah, United yeah. States. Yeah. And they could deploy there and, and within hours of getting there, set up an entire airstrip to support the landing of the, of the space shuttle, which that particular group, absolutely amazing people that work there. It just, I've never seen anything like it to, to basically go to an empty desert, so to speak, right? And then set up, uh, you know, a flight line and a command center to be able to support something like the space shuttle come down. Now, we don't have that, but going back to your other question, that's a, you know what, I don't, I suppose they could if they wanted to land there, but it, it's not ideal. Mm. You might as well just land at that strip there by Edwards Air Force Base. You might as well land at Edwards Air Force Base. But as you recall, the space shuttles, that program stopped landing at Edwards Air Force Base because of cost. Yeah, It was just easier to li- uh, land on the flight line back in Cape Canaveral in Florida. Yeah. It was just, why not just land it where you're going to rebuild it and, yeah, and shoot it, it back again? Off. Yeah. It makes sense, right? So... It's too bad. I, I saw the space shuttle land four times when I was in elementary school in Southern really? California. We took so field cool. trips out there. That's so Most cool. Most amazing thing I've ever seen. Four times I got to see it land. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I have my own theory that the space shuttle was – that was a, a – again, it's a fun theory. Sure. That, but I always think like what better way to send up like a military like, mm-hmm. orbital fighter or bomber than to – paint it as a civilian space agency and put it in the public eye and be like oh here's a shuttle launch and like what better way to disarm everyone it's like when we wanted to take uh we had plans to take 747s and put rotary cruise missile launchers on them there's another (laughs) there's another plan that was to actually put three icbms in a 747 and they'd be able to drop them over the ocean and then go into orbit i mean what better way to just you know don't look over here it's just a 747 what better way to shroud a military, an orbital, like an orbital bomber than to just put it right in the public eye and be like, oh, it's NASA. But, right, um, right. But, well, I, and that wasn't my area of expertise or anything, and it's not something that I've followed as a historian, not, <clears throat> not for that. But like you said, it's interesting theories, and I'm pretty sure that there were classified military operations Absolutely. Uh, that NASA conducted because they are a part of the federal government. It's They have a budget. They, yeah. they, they need to do those types of things. But what's really interesting is more than NASA, the Air Force themselves have launched more rockets and done more in orbit yeah. than NASA's history. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And a lot of it. A lot of it happens at Vandenberg Air Force Base, yeah. where Daniel was stationed all those years. I yeah. mean, they're launching stuff all the time yeah. into orbit, and so you don't. That's not NASA. Yeah. People don't realize that it's yeah. not NASA. Yeah. So I remember as a kid living in Southern California, there were times when we caught wind that okay, Vandenberg in Central California is going to launch a missile, and it's kind of nighttime, and where we were at in the high desert or Southern California, we could look out about the right time, and you could see a contrail of a missile being launched into orbit that's from so, where we're at. I remember so, that growing up as a kid. It's pretty interesting. That's so, so cool. Um, and, and, so what do you think about, we'll do, 
you cool it through in like another 10 minutes you cool with that go sure, to 345 245 your time sure um sure I don't know if, so in 1969, Lockheed Martin was contracted by the government to design, not to build, but to design the largest possible spacecraft using current technology and material science, current being 1969. Right. It, it was just, it was kind of a thought experiment, but it was also, you know, what if, what if our aircraft carriers are taken out and what if we are, because, you know, public opinion was shifting we didn't know if that would go to global opinion shifting about vietnam you know so we want to prepare for a future where our allies you know all of like our bases in germany and japan and south korea like what if one day they just booted us out like how are we going to prepare for that <clears throat> and what they came up with was the lockheed martin cl 1201 and it was a flying aircraft carrier and i'll send you a link after this i'll text it to you it's sure. awesome Sure. Had a wingspan of 1120 feet. <laughs> it was powered by a, I think a two gigawatt nuclear reactor. It could stay aloft for oh, 40, stay aloft for 41 days, go at 30,000 feet. Too big for an airport, so it had 182 lift fans, 747 engines in the wings that would go vertical. So it was, I think it was like. 50 on each wing and then there were banks in the nose so it was just wow and this thing would obviously never built and it would carry 22 f4 phantoms 11 in each wing not under in the wings were hangers and it was supposed to have a crew of 845 so yeah I don't, it's my favorite thing it's ridiculous it's literally like i saw a 747 superimposed over it everything good yeah yeah, I'm, you reminded me of a book. Uh, this is even before my time. This is when my uh, when my dad and my uncles and everything, when, when they were teenagers, it's uh, called Tom Swift. And so it's like this inventor genius. And the very first book that is written by the author is about his atomic flying ship. Yeah. And so it has these atomic lifters on the bottom of it it is huge, right? Yeah. And inside, in the fuselage, it has, it can have these mini helicopters, a little single-seater jet plane yeah. and stuff like that. It has experimental labs all through it. Yeah. It's, it's a great kid story. It really is. It really gets the imagination going. Yeah. And I'm going, this book is like 1940s, 1950, something like this, right? Yeah. And I've got the whole first series yeah. that was passed down to me. And now my kid's, are reading that my yeah. boy is reading that right now yeah yeah and so it's just, can you, i don't know if you were able to pull it up there but i mean it's, it's pretty it's almost like what you're saying yeah and i think i saw a youtube video on that something similar just the other day and i'm going it, it's too big yeah. for it yeah yeah it, it, I, but i won't i, I want to see what i want to see is the helicarrier from, from avengers Marvel. yeah yeah. Now that makes more sense to me. Yeah. Quite honestly, building something to that scale that can actually, like an aircraft carrier, but lift out of the water and whatnot, yeah. and, fly, and then launch aircraft. That's to me sounds even more practical. Sure. But I don't know the physics and yeah. the, the, the cost would be so enormous. It would be that's crazy. why we. That's why the U.S. hasn't done stuff like that yet. That we don't have a budget yeah. for things like that. Yeah. No. No. It's physically possible. It's just right. Who, right. We don't, we don't, who has the trillions of dollars to do that? No. Um, so I wanted to tie that in with, uh, what's your opinion on the uh, the Phoenix Lights in 1997? That the biggest UFO sighting, or even the governor of Arizona at the time, Fife Symington, who is a former Air Force pilot, even he said, I have no idea what it is. Because the, the general, the official claim was that it was A-10 Warthog shooting flares. Fife Symington was like, as an Air Force fighter, he's like, I can tell you, Flares don't stay in perfect formation for like an hour <laughs> and circle. He was like right. flares, right. he's like even long lasting flares. And this thing, they said this thing had a wingspan that someone described it as it looked like a B-2 bomber. And someone else said, no, you could land our entire fleet of B-2 bombers on the wings of this thing. It was, the, it's probably the most notorious right. behind Roswell. It's probably the biggest UFO sighting ever because there's actually videos of it. It's 1997 in March and there was, I mean, it was like 
It was hysteria. There's tens of thousands of people were calling the police. It was, yeah. Wow. It was a, yeah. it was a big thing. Yeah. Um, was this at, was this at the Phoenix airport by any chance? This, this was, it was I over, I saw something it about was that. over yeah. Phoenix. It was just over the city. It was so in, I believe it was in March 1997. Um, yeah, I was going to tie that into. I was like, I wonder if if they did build the CL 1201. <laughs> I just I, I always think like. That's the most realistic explanation because obviously you want it to be aliens, but it's like sure, realistically, sure. like you know, they did contract the design. There's actual schematics for the twelve hundred one. It's right, I mean, it looks right. like something out of Marvel, but yeah. Right. Um, um, I think it, it's probably just a giant weather balloon. Quite honestly, <laughs> weather balloon and extra swamp gas. That Arizona I'm, swamp I'm gas. I'm telling you, it's it's those desert lights. They they do things to you. You know, there's psychotropic yeah. plants out there in the desert that people eat some i guess some ayahuasca just... some peyote yeah getting a little wild <laughs> yeah possibly uh, yeah i i don't have a real comment on that I, yeah it'd be interesting i'm curious to see that um, yeah i'll send you some I, stuff yeah and i don't personally believe in aliens anyways yeah. i just i just don't i i i know the universe is so infinitely large compared to our pea brains and yeah. everything and our understanding and it would be nice to have yeah visitors yeah. so to speak i don't personally yeah believe that i think one day humans will get out there yeah i i mean i'll never see it i yeah. don't know that my great grandkids will ever see it at yeah. this point we we can't go back to the moon for crying out loud yeah <laughs> let alone mars that we were supposed to go to i mean yeah. we see these little tiny robots i'm like come on yeah. Don't we not have the technology? If, if if the U.S. military has built something like what you're suggesting, why can't we go to Mars? Hmm. Right? Why why can't we go back to the moon and actually establish a working moon base? Back because to, back to the, the nuclear theories, theory. Yeah, yeah. That a lot of the theories floating around in the 80s and even the early 90s was cre- uh, build a moon base and use that as a launching point into the rest of our solar system at least because you're not fighting the earth's gravity and everything yeah, not but we, we we can't even get along down here what makes this think we're going to get along up there we we can't figure that out yeah so, it's, so i'll never see it and i'm gonna i my grandma used to say um you never regret what you don't have and True. so it's hard for me to say yeah. i'll regret not seeing that yeah you but can. i'll never see it so i'm yeah. not gonna bother with it yeah but it it makes good stories. I mean, yeah. it really does. I, I'd have to investigate that Phoenix one. Yeah. Honestly, I, um, if we've got something, if we've got something that big in our, I don't know, arsenal or, or in our toolbox, so to speak, there's only a couple places probably on the planet. Truly. You could keep it hidden from radar. Nevada. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right in the middle of the mountains or some, or Antarctica. Yeah. Or, or Yeah. Or that. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I, I said I'll let yeah. you go, so I'll let you go. But hey, we definitely need to do another one, and uh, because you're interested in starting a podcast, correct? I am. I yeah. am. I sure am. Uh, we're doing these uh, survival things. I've got a rich background. My my we're, my wife and I are both educated, you know, and um, we're constantly reading, like, kind of like what you are. I've just recently discovered Audible, and I've yeah. recently discovered oh, that you can put the speed up to five or something it sounds like chipmunks talking but yeah. you're done with it so yeah um but i mean we're pretty well educated we've, we've been putting into a lot of practice we feel fortunate with this coronavirus thing that man we got a chance to get about a nine acre hobby farm out in rural tennessee and right now i think as of yesterday or this morning one case has finally been reported in our county yeah so we're far removed from the big cities yeah, and you're whatnot. Fine. Um, it'll get here as it has, and it'll be it'll be um, it's gonna it looks like it's gonna follow the same pattern. There's a case, another case, 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 case. Then there'll be a cluster, 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 and then all of a sudden it'll boom right. and exponentially grow yeah. uh, before it goes down again. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing in the big cities around yeah. us. That's exactly what happened in New York. One case. Then another case, yeah. then a cluster, and then before you know, boom, it's exploded, yeah, that's the, and they can't keep up. Yeah, I mean that's the 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 viral nature of it is yeah. literally yeah exponential explosion. But yeah, it's yeah. the the hope is that we can we can get through the peak because if you get through the peak, you're fine. 
you'll still have the problem, but it's a lot easier. Right. It's it's hump day basically. You got to get over hump right. day. Right. Right. I just don't want it. Oh my goodness. I do I, I. From what I'm hearing, I don't even want it. Just to ha- say I had it and I got I survived it and now have an immunity. To- nah, I don't want this mess. Yeah. I'll take the I'll take the flu. Yeah. Before I take this mess. So. Yeah, I think one of my friends has it. He sent me a picture of his temperature. Oh it's man. Like 104 temperature. His dad's a doctor and he's he's telling him he's like just stay home. It's like take right. an ice bath. But yeah, he's right. said he's sick as a dog. So mm. yeah, I'm doing my part and just uh doing a little exercise out in the neighborhood. I just I I walk a mile in the mornings, get my brain going, but I've been spending all day in here just been doing a podcast every day. I'm like <laughs> I'm like, "Hey, I'm doing awesome. my, I'm the, I keep telling everyone, I'm like, "Hey, cr- I'm like coronavirus has been amazing for me because everybody's free to do a podcast. Everybody's like, "I got time." And so I'm just I'm like a, I'm a high school English teacher, and so we're not supposed to go back to work potentially April 24th now. Yeah. It could be the rest of the school year, so I'm doing online stuff with my students, but otherwise, I'm, I want to do podcasts. Yeah, because I think I think at the end of this, Tommy, people that are doing podcasts are the only ones that are going to be employed. Yeah, <laughs> I know. That's why. Yeah, that's why I'm looking at it like, <laughs> dude, people that would. I have a guy coming on Friday, who yeah. well, I'm on, t- tomorrow I'm having on a rocket scientist. Um, on Wednesday I'm having on Dale Comstock, who's been on before, a former Delta Force. Because nice. he can't get, nice. he lives in Bali, but he can't get back because he was here visiting his daughter when all the quarantines kicked in. So he's right. like, I got nothing else to do. So he's coming on. He's like, I got nothing to do. So we're just podcasting. Friday, nice. I'm having on a, um, having on a nuclear fusion professor from Oxford. Some dude who's normally just wrote a book, busy and booked. He is someone that's you know hired to be a speaker. Right. He's got nothing doing. So he he, saw, he he told me he's like, hey, do you want to guess? And I was like, absolutely. So yeah, coronavirus <laughs> is doing wonders for me, but it's uh, not to belittle yeah. not to belittle the actual you know sure. the deaths and hardships, but just make sure. it light of it. But um, sure. yeah, let's, yeah, we'll do let's, this again. Let's absolutely. Send, I'll send you my schedule, and yeah, man, come on again. And I appreciate uh, it. Yeah, dude, thank you so much for doing it, and uh, stay safe, and let me know if the men in black come knocking on your door. All right. Likewise. Take care, buddy. All right, man. Peace. (laughs)